Well, I notice I'm the only speaker so far, not including Dr. Wolf last night, who is not wearing a tie. But uh, the instructions I received from Dr. Sandra Klein were that the dress code is business casual. And as you can imagine, when Dr. Klein gives a command, I am quick to, <laughs> quick to comply. So here I am. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, U.S. dollar hegemony, the end of dollar hegemony, and what that means for the, for, for the business landscape. In other words, for the individual entrepreneur, for the business person, for industries. So a move from the macroeconomic discussion that we've mainly, mainly been having up to now to a more microeconomic discussion. Now, what exactly does dollar hegemony mean? For purposes of this talk, Right, I mean something like the system we have now, right? So uh, a, a government-issued fiat U.S. dollar, which also serves as the world's reserve currency, giving the U.S. monetary authorities the ability to influence not only you know business conditions, economic conditions uh, at home, but also to have vast influence in the economies. Uh, of the world to intervene in foreign policy and you know affect uh, 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 governance and all sorts of issues around the world. That's what I mean by dollar hegemony. So I want us to sort of think through what would it be like, what would be the implications for entrepreneurs, for business people, if that system were to be replaced by something else. You know, not by a government issued digital currency, which would be even worse, but imagine that it were replaced you know, by something uh, much better. You know, commodity money, of course, would be great. There's not much appetite for returning to the gold standard uh, in the West. Maybe it would be the gold dinar or, or something else. Uh, but, you know, imagine a world in which the, the U.S. monetary authority does not have the influence that it has now. Okay, so either a commodity standard, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's competing fiat currencies, who knows. But let's start by thinking through, you know, how... how you know, what are, what are the basic decisions that businesses, entrepreneurs, investors make sort of under conditions of, uh, uh, of real money? And then we'll address how uh, dollar hegemony uh, makes those decisions much more difficult, okay? So let's start, you know, as, as, uh, as uh, economics teachers like to do with Robinson Crusoe. I'm not sure if that's exactly what he looked like, but, uh, you know, imagine Crusoe on his island and, you know, he's, he's uh, you know, pulling fish out of the sea with his hands and eating them on the spot, or he's eating coconuts that just sort of fall from the trees, right? So there's not much, uh, there's, there's not much planning, uh, there's not much, uh, he doesn't have capital, capital goods, he doesn't have tools, he doesn't have a complex economy, he just has a sort of an immediate consumption-based economy. But now imagine that he has the idea, right, you know, hey, I could catch more fish with a fishing net rather than, you know, just using my bare hands. Now, of course, he's got a, there's some forward thinking that's required, some planning required now, Right, you know, he has to refrain from consumption, uh, maybe you know, uh, several days in advance to, to to build up a stock of fish he can eat on the day in which he's building a net, gathering the materials and assembling them. You know, instead of uh, grabbing fish out of the ocean and eating them, or maybe he has to go a few days. He has to fast for a few days. Uh, of course, the reason he would do that is because he imagines that once he has the net, he'll be able to catch more fish. Uh, and, and have a higher standard of living uh, than he did before. But, but he's got to, in, you know, engage in a period of sort of, uh, uh, you know, thoughtful economic planning to figure out if he wants to do this at all, and if so, what's the best way to do it. He has to engage in production, in other words. As Murray Rothbard describes it in Man, Economy, and State, production is the use by man of available elements of his environment as indirect means as cooperating factors with his labor to arrive eventually at a consumer's good that he can use directly uh, to arrive at his end. In other words, production is purposeful human action to, to create intermediate goods, capital goods, so-called, that are not consumed directly, but can be used to produce things that can be consumed in the future. So once Crusoe begins thinking about production, right, uh, he, he, what he's really doing is transforming uh, you know, features of the natural environment, like a bamboo stick, 
right, into something that he can actually use as a net or a spear or whatever kind of uh, equipment he, he would now have available uh, for catching fish. So production is about transformation of goods into other goods. It involves, it implies human purpose, right, purposeful human action in Mises' terminology. It also implies the passage of time Right? He's got to put in some effort today in building that net so that he can consume you know, the bounty of the ocean uh, in the future. So he's, hey, he has some sort of a time perspective here. A and it also involves some uncertainty. Right? I mean, it's possible the net won't work. The net will fail. Uh, it won't actually allow him to consume more fish than he did before, and his effort will have been wasted. So the decision maker, Crusoe, in, in this case, you know, he needs some kind of a tool some, some mechanism, some algorithm, some means of thinking, you know, for deciding if, if building a net is a good idea, and if so, how should he build the net? He needs some way to compare the value of present means, in other words, the labor that he will devote to making a net as opposed to eating fish, catching fish and eating them, uh, with the value of the future ends, i.e. all the fish that he'll enjoy once he has this fishing net. Okay. Now, I mean, Crusoe himself, you know, the literal Crusoe, I mean, it's Tom Hanks, so he can do anything, but uh, the literal Crusoe, you know, he, he can just sort of, he can wing it, right? I mean, he just sort of thinks through, well, uh, with a net, I could probably get, you know, 10 fish, and here's how much I like fish. I mean, it's not that difficult for him to make a reasonable estimate of whether it's a good idea to build a net or not. But in a modern industrial advanced economy, with all of its complexity, right, with, you know, an, an almost infinite array of possible means that could be used to produce an end, you know, like this little slide clicker I'm holding in my hand. Think of all the different materials that could be used to make it, the different kinds of uh, technologies that could be embedded inside, different production methods, production location, you know, factory type. Should the firm that's producing these things be organized as a corporation or a proprietorship or whatever? I mean, there's an almost infinite array of possibilities. How in the world could a purposeful human actor figure out, is it a good idea to take time and effort to make these things today, you know, in anticipation of selling them in the future and getting some money for selling them? And if so, what's the, what's the most effective way to produce this good or service? Well, we do have a planning tool. Entrepreneurs do have a technique for figuring this out. It's what Ludwig von Mises called economic calculation. Now, economic calculation is familiar to most of us in the context in which Mises first introduced it, i.e. the socialist calculation debate. So Mises introduced the concept of economic calculation to explain why socialism would fail, because under socialism, uh, all goods and services are owned by the state, so there's no exchange of inputs like labor or bamboo sticks or, you know, whatever. So there are no prices for those intermediate goods, no prices for factors, and therefore no way for entrepreneurs to calculate, to compare the value of future ends with the value of present means expressed in sort of a common unit because there are no market prices in that economy. But Mises' argument is much more general. It's not just about socialism. It's about what production is and what entrepreneurs do and the importance, uh, the, indeed, the, the, the necessity of having prices expressed in a common monetary unit uh, in order to compare across time and across space. So let me illustrate with what I mean. He, this is a picture that I use in my entrepreneurship classes, and uh, it, it's, it's, it's a little sort of graphical depiction of what the entrepreneur does, what entrepreneurship is, right? So, you know, the entrepreneur begins with, if you look in the blue box there, the entrepreneur has some subjective attributes, beliefs, preferences, expectations, right? You know, what do I want to do? Uh, how important is commercial success for me? What, how do I feel about work-life balance, et cetera, et cetera? I have some beliefs about possible future states of the world. If I create a company and build these little clickers, I can sell them and make a lot of money and live a nice, you know, lifestyle, whatever. Uh, the entrepreneur does have access to information about the past and present. In other words, I know the current prices of plastic and aluminum and the laser and all the stuff that's in here. 
right? Now I have to interpret those uh, data subjectively and I have some technical knowledge from my engineers about you know, how do you actually make one of these? Can you make one? Based on those uh, beliefs on the part of the entrepreneur, based on that knowledge, based on my interpretation of the world, uh, I as the entrepreneur then, I then decide whether to act or not, right? So acting could be creating a company or producing these uh, uh, gadgets or uh, producing a new version of the gadget or creating a new sort of you know marketing campaign to try to sell the gadget. Now the entrepreneur is acting in order to bring about what he imagines the future will look like. You know, prosperity, success, I'm on the cover of Inc. magazine with my little clicker and so forth, right? I act, if my action is to try to bring about that state of the world, I, you know, I act in reality, but of course my ability to bring about my desired ends depends not only on my own actions, but also on the actions of other people, consumers and other companies and uh, uh, you know, potential partners and rivals and so forth. So the, the actual future may be different from the imagined future, right? It may be that I produce, maybe I try to make these things and it's a flop, you know, they don't even work. You press the button and it doesn't advance the slide or you press the little laser button and it doesn't allow you to blind somebody uh, in the audience, right? It could be that it works from a technical point of view, but consumers don't really like these things. They're not willing to pay as much as I imagined. Or another company rushes to market with an even better product before I get mine out the door. So it may be that the imagined future is, is not as good, sorry, the actual future falls short of my expectations. You know, I earn losses. I gotta go back to the drawing board and figure it out. Uh, maybe the imagined future, the actual future is even better than I imagined. I've got more profits and now I can decide whether to reinvest them and so forth. But this is sort of a, an idea of the process that entrepreneurs go through, you know, sort of, uh, you know, time and time again. Now, in order to do this in a complicated economy, right, to be able to figure out, did, did reality meet my expectations? I can't do it just like Crusoe, well, I just sort of think about it in my mind. I need numbers, right? I need, I need prices of goods uh, and services that exist now. Well, I need prices for plastic and aluminum and glass and uh, you know, computer chips and so forth. Right? I need to have beliefs about what prices will be in the future, and I need to have actual prices as they materialize to know whether my beliefs were accurate or not. In other words, I need some system of calculation where I can compare heterogeneous items in a common unit. That's exactly what the price system does. Okay? Just, you know, again, some classroom examples I use. You know, I show something like this to my students, and I say, okay, suppose you were going to build in this example, build, building a railroad, it's an example from Mises, right? No, should, you, should, you, should the tracks be made out of steel or titanium? Which is the cheapest way to lay a railroad? And I show the students some information like this, and they look at it, and they scratch their heads, and they try to puzzle it out, and a lot of times they'll say, well, you know, it looks like method two is cheaper because, you know, method one uses 1,500, um, 1500 stuff, and method two uses 1,100 stuff, and 1,100 is less than 1,500. But, but of course, it doesn't make sense to add you know, units of a physical material and labor into, you know, there's no common denominator. Now, this is an easy problem to solve, of course, if you have the prices of these inputs. Then you can say, how much would I have to spend to use method one or method two? And I can easily see which is cheaper. Uh, likewise, you know, should I use a more capital intensive or a more labor intensive method of production? Without access to prices, it's impossible to compare those. But with prices, it's a relatively easy, almost a trivial calculation. And the entrepreneur needs prices to estimate the value of his capital stock and to figure out whether he should invest in replacing used capital equipment and so forth. Now this is just looking at things in the present. Now imagine that I've got to anticipate the prices in the future. How much will consumers be willing to pay for this thing? How much will I earn in sales from the output once I've produced it? How long is the production gonna take? I gotta take that into consideration. What will be the consumer demand for my product? What will my competitors do? Will there be you know, changes in the weather or, or you know, other unanticipated factors that will impact the profitability of my action? And this is you know, not a trivial task. Now imagine the monetary system is what it is today. So now, you know, we've got cheap credit, 
Uh, we've got the printing presses turned on at full speed. We've got uh, interest rates that are different from the natural interest rates. Walter Block was talking about this in his lecture. We've got constant changes in the value of money associated with monetary policy, not just the demand for money by users, by people who want money, but uh, changes in the supply of money as uh, under the control of the central bank. Increases in sort of the, 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 uh, uh, the, the variability of prices, the noise associ associated with the price system, price system. And of course, you know, trying to figure out what the monetary authority will do, meaning that business people have to be, you know, armchair psychologists as well. What, what color tie did Greenspan have on? And, you know, what was Bernanke's Janet Yellen? You know, what, what was her expression in the press conference trying to figure out what she's really thinking? Well, actual psychologists have not had a good time lately. Uh, there's been a huge attack on a lot of the academic literature and psychology. It doesn't replicate. There have been several scandals involving data manipulation by prominent social psychologists. Um, think about how much money entrepreneurs spend on macroeconomic forecasting. Okay, this is not trying to forecast, will consumers like my gadget? But what will the Fed be doing between now and when my gadget hits the market? There are lots of uh, companies that offer, you know, Fed watching kind of tools and services. Of course, think about all the people who are employed in the business of depreciating the currency. Uh, the, the federal government is one of the, well, about, depending on how you measure, uh, about a third to a half of all economists in the United States are employed by a government agency of one sort. Uh, at least a few of those might be able to do something, you know, that actually adds value uh, in, instead. Okay, so, so what happens in an economy like the one we have now with fiat currency, a boom-bust cycle? You know, other speakers have spoken and will speak more about the macro side. But on the micro side, think about what this means for firms, for entrepreneurs and investors. Right, so with artificially low interest rates and implicit government guarantees against failure, right, lenders are incentivized to make riskier loans to less valuable projects. These low interest rates also encourage entry uh, by entrepreneurs who might be less capable than entrepreneurs who would enter if interest rates were at their natural levels. You know, even, even you know, sort of, sort of high quality entrepreneurs may be tempted to take the cheap credit even if they know the boom is unsustainable. So you get a lot of snake oil salesmen, you know, who can operate in the fiat money economy who would not be able to operate as well if we had natural money. You've got so-called zombie firms, you've got zombie credit, right? So high quality entrepreneurs, those who have good products and services who can satisfy the consumer, have to devote extra effort, time, energy, resources, not just to producing their product, but somehow, you know, convincing market participants that they are not zombies. Right, whether that's additional marketing, product development, whether that's some kind of a contracting thing where they have to give up more decision rights to investors because investors are worried that this might be a potential zombie company. You know, there's, there's spillover, negative, negative spillover harms from zombie firms. They negatively impact the industry and, and so forth. So entrepreneurs have to spend their effort figuring out how to navigate all of these other things in addition to just doing the stuff that entrepreneurs normally do, okay? There's an interesting book that was published by Liberty Fund uh, back in the 80s called Economic Calculation Under Inflation that describes from the firm's point of view uh, some of these additional challenges that are introduced by a world like the one that we have now. A, a quick comment, um, this relates to something Dr. S Dr. Salerno said. The claim here is not that we need quote unquote stable money, whatever that means, but only we need a monetary system that is not subject to government interference. As this gentleman, whom you all know, uh, put it, economic calculation uh, does not require stability in the sense in which that term is used. It, what it, what it requires is a monetary system whose functioning is not sabotaged by government interference. Okay, this is in chapter 15. I'll let you read the rest of the, uh, sorry, chapter 12, section five. He says, economic calculation doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to be good enough. Okay, so to conclude, if by the end of dollar hegemony, we mean a monetary unit that is less subject to political control, you know, price changes that reflect changes in the value of the commodity, and relative price changes for entrepreneurs that reflect changes in the relative values of goods and services they buy or sell, rather than the whims of government officials, and a reduced scope for government intervention more generally, 
in other words, fewer obstacles in the way of economic cal calculation by entrepreneurs, then I say, bring it.